wanted to share today uh, my experience going on uh, two ghost tours to the Sorrel Weed House in Savannah, Georgia. I did not pick this location because it said weed. I am not that immature. I did laugh about it. Savannah is one of the most haunted places in America. It is unreal. Everywhere you walk, there's dead people under your feet practically. And everybody seems pretty cool with it. Both times I've been to the city, we've stayed in the same hotel, the Riverfront Marriott. And the first time we stayed there, we had this paranormal experience. And I talked to uh, someone that worked there and I said, you know, have you ever had a thing with the ghosts in this hotel? And they were like, no, I've never seen a ghost in this hotel. And I said, if you saw one, would you like freak out and immediately quit your job? And she was like, no, there's no place I can get a job in this city that isn't haunted. Everything is haunted. I went on a ghost tour where they talked about the haunted CVS pharmacy. There is a haunted Panera Bread. This city is crawling with ghosts. It's a weird image, isn't it? A crawling ghost. It's like um, Crimson Peak, you know, when that ghost was crawling on the floor. So me and this reader, and I'm not going to name her because I don't know if she wants to be named, we went together on a uh, ghost tour, on a trolley tour. And when I called to set up the trolley tour, I found out that the Sorrel Weed House had not just the tours that come by, but you could actually pay to be locked in for a long time at night and do a paranormal investigation. I'll start this out by saying I had a really annoying experience on Twitter uh, the day that I signed up for this paranormal investigation. I was excited. I was like, this is gonna be so scary. I'm gonna go to a haunted house. It's gonna be so cool. And this one woman who's like a professional skeptic, like she's built her life, I guess, out of being a fun hater and shitting on everybody else's good time. And so she like jumped into my mentions to chastise me for how unscientific this was. It's like, bitch, I'm not going for science. If I wanted to go for science, I would go tour like the DuPont labs or some shit. I'm not going for science. I'm going to get scared. And if I go to this thing and I get creeped out, my money has been well spent, okay? Don't, if people are into ghosts, if people are into spooky shit, it doesn't hurt anyone. It doesn't hurt a single person to just let them live their lives and have fun without your bullshit opinions. Anyway, just to give you some background on the Sorrel Weed House, it is apparently one of the most active hauntings in Savannah, not the most active haunting. But yeah, so it's one of the houses with the most paranormal activity. It's been investigated by ghost hunters. It's been on ghost adventures. It's just one of those houses that has a reputation. Apparently the first owners, and I'm not a historian, so this is stuff that, you know, I'm just kind of remembering from the tour, but apparently the, the guy who built the house was married to a woman named Matilda and they had slaves at their at their house um, and Matilda's favorite slave who well we were on the trolley part of the tour the guide described this slave Molly as just like a member of the family and I said did they free her and she said well no and I said then she wasn't like a member of the family was she so Matilda one day was looking for Molly. She couldn't find her anywhere in the house. She went out to the carriage house where the slave quarters were. That's where she found Molly with Francis. Now again, the way the tours couch it is that she was that Molly was having an affair. The tours want you to be like, oh, this poor broken-hearted woman was so betrayed by this person that she cared about. She didn't care about her, okay? She like treated her like property. But that's what happened. She walked in, she saw her husband with Molly, she went and she killed herself by jumping out of a second story window head first into the courtyard. And you know, that obviously didn't go well for her. The legend is that the family went to the funeral and when they came back, they found Molly hanging from the rafters in her bedroom in an apparent suicide. There is dispute uh, as to whether or not Molly actually committed suicide. There are other apparitions in the house. Um, the tours state that slaves in the lower level in the like kitchen area, which is like a basement sort of, like walkout basement sort of area, that there were voodoo rituals. I don't think it was probably voodoo. It was probably um, conjure, root magic, gullah magic, um, hoodoo, that kind of thing. Voodoo is more associated with like Louisiana. But due to this alleged 
magic that was worked in the basement, there is a seven foot tall shadow entity there that they call the shadow man. I think they said he's seven feet tall. He's just a shadow person. I do not fuck with shadow people. So I wanted nothing to do with that. There's also uh, a room that used to be a surgery because the uh, original owner's son became a surgeon and the kids in the house liked to play down there. So now there's activity in that room of kids playing in the surgery room. There are also the bones of some soldiers from the Revolutionary War who had bivouacked in the area before the house was built. And apparently when they worked on the house they found bones and I don't know just covered them back up. There's another spirit named Samuel. He was a slave. Uh, he haunts the carriage house upstairs. On the first tour I went on with the reader that, that came along with me uh, it was a very sort of brief visit. You walk in, they take you into a room, they tell you about the hauntings that are there, they tell you about, you know, things other people have experienced, and then they move you along to the next location. We didn't go into the carriage house uh, on that one. We just uh, stayed in the house on the, the main level of the house and then the lower level of the house. The moment we stepped in the house, I had a really strong, bad feeling. Uh, I. I don't really call myself a medium. I do have a lot of empathic stuff. Uh, I did talk to two mediums that were on the later on the ghost hunt and they both were like, well, then you need to develop that because you're clearly, you know, so it did, it did, the energy did affect me, but I didn't like see anything. There was no like, oh, someone died here type thing. It was just a really sort of oppressive, bad energy when I walked into the, the, main foyer area. There was the ladies parlor and the men's parlor. They used to have parties in there. That felt very happy and lively. Um, like there was uh, a lot of life and a lot of happiness and joy going on in that room. Um, allegedly, if you stand in front of the mirror in the ladies parlor and take a photo of yourself in the mirror, sometimes you'll see someone uh, that wasn't there. You'll see like Matilda or you'll see someone in the, the picture with you. Uh, I tried it. I didn't see it. It was when we went downstairs that things were more active. I had seen, I believe it was BuzzFeed Unexplained, if that's the, I might be saying that wrong, but it was the, it was the BuzzFeed uh, guys went into the house and there's a hallway with a chair and if you sit in the chair sometimes the shadow man will come to you and like I said I don't fuck with shadow people. That's a completely different kind of haunting that terrifies me. So I did not want to go anywhere near that thing. Well, of course, when the big group files in, what happens? I end up way over by that. And the reader that came with me was like shaking. And she was like, oh my God. And I said, what? And she said, I just felt something touch the back of my neck. And she reached up and like drew a line across the back of my neck. And the tour guide said, oh, that's a very common thing that we hear about a lot is that somebody plays with the back of your neck. There's a sofa down there that they call the most haunted sofa in Savannah. I sat down on it and this was in the room where the kids like to play in the surgery room where the, the, the children used to like to play. I was sitting on the couch and when I stood up, something tugged my dress because uh, I was wearing a skirt. Something tugged my skirt. That was really weird, uh, but kind of cute because it didn't feel malicious. It felt like a kid was maybe underneath the couch and being goofy. Uh, there was a little boy sitting on the couch next to me, not a ghost boy, like an actual little boy who had come on the tour, sitting next to me and he looked at me and got really wide eyes and he said, did you do that? I don't know what he was talking about because I didn't do anything. I said, I didn't do anything. And he jumped up and shot off and ran back to his parents. So I don't know what that little boy felt, but something happened to that little boy. I didn't get any photos of good orbs, like any orb activity I got was clearly dust. Uh, I did see an orb when I set up, I, I accidentally flipped to video and I did see one, but I hadn't, the video wasn't turned on. I had just accidentally, when I was trying to take pictures, flipped it to video. And so I wish I would have gotten that because it was a very clear and you could see it just like in, not even just on the film, not even just on the camera. Like I looked up and it was still, I was like, whoa. So when we went to do the paranormal investigation, it was just me and my husband because it was very late at night. 
It's in the middle of a conference. I probably shouldn't have done it because I was dead for all my panels the next day. I looked like a zombie. I looked terrible. My husband and I arrived. The paranormal investigation started at 11 o'clock. There were two other groups there, but there were two mediums there and this other girl. Then there was a group that I can really only describe. If you've ever seen Supernatural, they were the ghost facers. I kept referring to them as the ghost facers. I had absolutely, I mean, they, okay. <laughs> I don't mean to make fun of them. I hope none of them stumble across this video. I, I, you, you gave me a lot of joy. These are all like people in like their early to mid twenties and they were very serious. They were there, there was gonna be haunting. It was gonna happen. Right off the bat, I was like, they are gonna see stuff. They are gonna have experiences because that's what they want to have. I am not a big skeptic, but I do take things with a grain of salt. So we arrived, they gave us a brief tour of the house and told us stuff like, you know, don't sit on this furniture, don't sit on that furniture. This is where you can go. This is what you need to stay out of. They give you a walkie talkie. Uh, they give you an EMF reader. They give you uh, a spirit box and a flashlight. And the flashlight is for safety, but it's also for like ghost communication. I have thoughts on the equipment that they give you. Like I said, I'm not a skeptic. I believe, but I take some stuff with a grain of salt and EMF readers are one of the things that I take with a grain of salt. An EMF thing is like what the electrician uses when they come to your house and they're trying to figure out if a wire is grounded incorrectly or something. An EMF reader is what the electrician brought to my house when we were trying to figure out if it was the light in my kitchen that was giving me seizures. It was because electromagnetic fields do have an effect on human bodies. That is why some people think their house is haunted and it turns out to be something completely different. It turns out to be wiring or whatever. I would use an EMF reader to debunk claims uh, of haunting more than I would to like prove that there was haunting. The spirit box, um, I think is bullshit. <laughs> it's a, it's just like a little like radio that doesn't work. It puts out this staticky burst of white noise. It's pulses of white noise that it puts out, but it picks up radio stations every now and then. And it just like, you'll be like walking all of a sudden like country music will come on. One of my favorite parts of the investigation was how much the serious paranormal researcher people, like that team, like concentrated on the spirit box and communicating with it. They're like, oh, we got all this stuff from the spirit box. Oh, we got, you know, I asked this and it said this. And it's like, we're in the middle of a city where there's probably lots of radio signals. So, it, you know, I, it's like, come on. I think you can get EVP and I did get EVPs in the house. I got two EVPs in the house, but I do not believe that the spirit box, like you can communicate and ask a question. Like I'd be like, how late are your parties? How late do your parties usually go? You know, or whatever, talking to like the spirits. And it would be like, static and then it would be like bleh, bleh, and you could tell that it was like a radio signal but like these the the ghost facers totally bought into it the flashlight the idea was very simple this is something you can do at home with your own flashlight it's you unscrew it a little bit not so much that like the connector isn't touching you just unscrew it just a little bit and you put it down somewhere and then you can ask a ghost like turn on the light turn off the light that kind of I do put some stock in that just because I think it would probably be easier to manipulate the batteries than it would be to manipulate a like a switch that probably takes a lot of work for a ghost. I brought my own digital recorder uh, that I use for picking up EVPs when I'm going ghost hunting and EVP is like elect electronic voice phenomenon or something like that or electromagnetic voice phenomenon I don't know what it means basically it means you get a ghost's voice on tape um and then you know you listen to it later and you're like oh holy shit there's like a voice on this tape so once they give you the tour and they load you down with all this stuff they let you go into the house by yourself they divided us up into three teams it went the mediums the ghost facers and then me and my husband 
So they split us up, and the first area that we were sent to was the ladies' parlor and the men's parlor, and then there was like an office area. On the first part of the tour, the mediums were picking up a lot of stuff in the ladies' parlor and the gentlemen's parlor. Uh, they said, there's a huge party. It's in full swing. Like, there's tons of people here. There's whatever. We got back into there, and like, I felt the energy, and it was like dead. It was like there, <laughs> it was dead. Uh, but it was like there was no energy there at all, and I was kind of like, we're not gonna get anything. And we really didn't. There, um, one of the pieces of equipment that they also have are these like little field detector things. Like, I don't know how it works. It's a little box, it has lights on it, it has an antenna. But if you get close and you break up whatever field it's emitting, it beeps and it, you know, kind of does a thing. One of the things they tell you at this house is that because there are so many tours that come through, because so many people want to come and investigate, the ghosts are kind of bored of the questions they get asked and will sometimes not answer because like, like our guide that night said, imagine if somebody came into your house every single night, like groups of people came into your house every single night and were like, how did you die? And she said also some of these spirits, depending on how they're manifesting at the time, might not know that they're dead. So I did things like I went in and I complimented the house and Matilda, you have a lovely house. I went into the ladies parlor and I said, Things like, you know, I'm new to the area. Where's the, who's the best dressmaker? Um, wow, it's been really hot. Hey, I think we're going to get a storm, which was cool. We did get a storm. There was a giant thunder and lightning storm while we're in this haunted ass house. You could not have asked for a better night. But it, despite asking these questions and asking all of these, you know, and saying, you know, you have a beautiful house, things like that, trying to engage with these spirits, on a level that you would politely as a, you know, the, to a living person. It just didn't work. I did get an EVP in the, the men's parlor. Um, I was talking about the bands that they would sometimes have. I said, you know, I heard you had some of the best bands in Savannah that would come play here. And then there's a bark. I tried to incorporate that into this video. I tried to record it. It didn't record. I can't really figure out how to transfer stuff from my digital recorder onto my computer. But it was a bark like a small yappy dog and it wasn't something that I heard at the time. So like a ghost dog was as good as we got up there. When we went into the office, which one of the mediums had said earlier, there was a presence standing by the fireplace. She, she said, oh no, there's a man here but he wants to be left alone. So I didn't really want to go into that office area because I didn't want to bother him. My husband goes in there and I heard him in there and I'm like, are you in the office? And so I went that way. And when I stepped in, the moment I stepped in, I smelled cigar smoke. At the end, when we all got together and shared our conclusions, I mentioned that I had smelled this really strong odor of cigar smoke. And the girl that was there to supervise the tour said that that's very common and that they actually had an employee on like his first day was closing up the house and he smelled cigar smoke and he freaked out because he thought he was going to get fired because he had let somebody smoke in the house on his watch. Basically the first floor was kind of a wash for us other than the ghost dog. When they said like, you know, switch areas or whatever, we were sent down into the basement. Mr. Jen is the one who investigated the area with the shadow man because like I said, again, I don't fuck with shadow people. There's apparently like if you sit in a chair, the shadow man will appear and he will come to you. So uh, Mr. Jen checked that out. He walked back and forth and was like, hey, do you want to come out? Do you want to like taunting the shadow man, taunting the demonic entity? I went into the surgery. They had a, a teddy bear down there that they had put an EMF reader in, which I thought was very cute. I said, hey, I have kids too. I really like kids. What, do you, what are some things you like to do? Do you like to play a game? Do you like to play hide and seek? Uh, all that stuff. Didn't get any readings in that room. Didn't get any feeling of a presence in that room at all. I did try to take some photos when we were down there when the lights were on. The photos turned out very blurry. I don't necessarily think that that's proof of things, to be honest. It it, you know, it just, it just wasn't happening. We also, down there, they gave us a, uh, like a heat thing, like a heat gun, like predator vision. 
And I have to admit, like, that I kind of played with that a little bit more just because I was like, ooh, I'm the predator, you know, like, I was having a good time. And then I hit a button, and it, like, mashed it up, and I freaked out. I'm like, holy shit, I am sure this thing is expensive. <laughs> like, oh, no. But it wasn't broken. They fixed it. One of the mediums came and told me what to do. The only EMF reading, I thought this was very cool, the only EMF reading I got the entire time that wasn't sparked by putting the thing too close to my cell phone was when one of the mediums, as she walked by me, the EMF thing went off. Like she had walked and then almost immediately there was an EMF reading as she went by. And it got stronger and then it was, it was like it was following her and I said, hey, I think you've got something following you. And she's like, I know. So that's the only time that I think the EMF reading actually detected any ghostly activity. The Shadow Man was a no-show. Thank God. Now the third area is the one that we had the strongest thing in and that was the carriage house. Um, the downstairs of the carriage house is a gift shop, but when you go upstairs, that was the former slave quarters. When we went up there, it was very emotional. Immediately, I felt this crushing in my chest. And I do think part of it was my preconceived thing of, oh my God, this is actual history. This actually happened. People actually were harmed here. And I can't take it was part of it. But there very much was a feeling of a presence there. Molly had her own room and it was in the back of the carriage house and that was where she was hung. Uh, my husband went in there and he had a very strong feeling of not being wanted in there. But while my husband was in there and I was in another part, the little field box thing where if you interrupt the field around it, it starts going off. Um, it went off and I said, are you doing that <laughs> to my husband? And he said, I am nowhere near that. One thing I will say is that Molly did not hang herself. She did not commit suicide. The feeling in there was of a murder. And when we all grouped up later and I said to the mediums, I said, she, Molly did not hang herself. She did not kill herself. And they both said, no, she did not. Uh, that was like the conclusion that we all came to. We did get an EVP up there and they had told us that there's a spirit up there uh, called Samuel that will sometimes you know mediums will get and I like will get that name when they go up there people will get you know so I tried to be like friendly just I don't know trying to find common ground is very difficult to talk to ghosts because it's a weird one-sided conversation when we went back to the hotel I listened for EVP I got one EVP in the carriage house and it was absolutely chilling it's a woman's voice and it sounds like she's saying, Samuel did it. I listened to it over and over. And I was like, this can't be my mind playing tricks on me. It sounds like a woman saying, Samuel did it. It didn't come from the spirit box. Uh, you can hear the spirit box going in the back, but then you can hear, Samuel did it. If, if you are um, a medium, if you are empathic and you go on this tour uh, or this investigation, prepare um, yourself before you go up there, maybe call your spirit guides, do something because it, it, it becomes immediately overwhelming. After the investigation portion, you all get together and you share your experiences. The mediums, uh, I'll cover them first because they were very down to earth. They were very grounded. Um, they just kind of talked and they said, yeah, there wasn't a lot of activity tonight. The woman mentioned the one following her. Um, they both mentioned that uh, when we first went through the house and they had the feeling of this giant party in there, that when they went in there, there was no activity. They felt nothing in those rooms. They didn't get uh, anything from those rooms. Uh, and, and the one medium actually sort of um, was surprised. She said she had never been uh, around a haunting where it changed so dramatically that just suddenly everything was, was gone. So maybe they didn't want us to be there. Maybe... They didn't want Yankees in their home. Now, the ghost facers, they wanted something to happen so badly and everything happened to them. You, if you could even imagine anything that could happen in a haunted house happened to them short of seeing an apparition. I don't, I don't think they mentioned seeing 
the shadow man. But it was like, oh, I went into the office room and I sat down in the chair and like I asked business questions and I put my hand out for a handshake and something shook my hand. They were just 100% everything, again, that could have possibly happened in this house happened. And it contradicted like what the mediums were saying. It contradicted what I felt. It contradicted what like the results the mediums got. It contradicted the results that we got. So I guess the ghosts were just saving it up for the ghost facer. Some things about the the investigation itself um, versus the tour. Uh, the first tour that we took was very much sanitized in terms of how they talked about it. Like I said, they made a big deal about how Molly the slave was this member of the family and they, you know, Matilda loved her. You can't love somebody that you're enslaving. The affair narrative all also irked me on the first tour that I took because it was made out to be like Molly was betraying her, was betraying poor Matilda, poor victimized Matilda who owned slave. I don't feel bad for Matilda. She was a slave owner. Now on the paranormal investigation portion, when it was a representative from the house itself, a person who was employed by the house to do this, uh, the attitude was completely different. They, uh, said that they didn't know whether Molly committed suicide or whether she was hanged, uh, but they didn't refer to it as an affair. They didn't refer to it as a rape, but they didn't refer, refer to it as an affair. They just said that, you know, she walked in and, and they were having sex, which again, it wasn't sex, it was rape, she was a slave. But it was much more respectful of that than um, the original tour was that kind of made Molly out to be a villain. They did not do that at the house. Uh, the, the representative at the house. I mean, we know that plantations make money from tours and ghost tours. We know that ghost stories, you know, uh, sell, but I definitely feel like the first tour, the trolley tour, was sensationalizing slavery to make money off of it. I, I don't know if that was our guy. Maybe it's the script she has to read. I don't know. That company re really needs to train their people to be sort of more respectful and they really need to rethink the language that their guides are using. Overall, um, the Sorrel Weed House is haunted. There is no doubt in my mind. As to the skeptic who like freaked out about how unscientific it was and how I was being robbed of my money, which again, I was not. If I went to a haunted house and I got to be at a haunted house from like 11 o'clock to 2 a.m., that's, you got your money, you know? We were in a haunted house hearing ghost stories. There was thunder and lightning and torrential rain outside. It was spooky. So I got my money's worth. Don't worry about it, skeptic. If something big had happened, if the ghost facer <laughs> experience was what I had, I would have thought it was fake. I would have thought that they were faking it. They are not faking it. It's not fake there. They're not duping people into believing that there are ghosts there. I do think if you go there and you are intent on interpreting every single thing that happens, every little glitch from the spirit box, picking up a country station, uh, every little woof on the EMF meter as you walk past a light switch, yeah, you are going to have this experience. But the fact that my that my husband and I went into this um, with our usual sort of blend of, yes, we believe this stuff exists. No, we don't necessarily believe it exists everywhere. Um, the small experiences that we had, the small, like the two EVPs, the, the, the feeling of, you know, death and oppression, all of that stuff um, make me believe that the Sorrel Weed House is haunted. The fact that nothing big and dramatic happened reinforces to me uh, that the paranormal investigation tour at the Sorrel Weed House is legit. It's on the up and up. It might use science and gadgets that I don't necessarily agree with. I honestly think the best uh, way to investigate a haunting is through a spirit board, through a pendulum, like talk about not scientific. It would be very easy to give someone an EMF reader and then leave something around to make it go off. Leave a cell phone 
anything that would emit, you know, like a, like a lamp under, like in a room that you can't go in. Oh, this door is haunted. No, there's a lamp behind it. There are ways that you can fake a paranormal investigation and you could very easily do that for money. You could very easily uh, dupe people, but I don't believe that's what's happening at the Sorrel Weed House. I do believe the paranormal investigation was worth it. Uh, I would recommend anybody do that. I guess the ghost facers are like regulars or something, so I'm, I hope that if you go do it, you get to meet them and see what I'm talking about. So yeah, they're not faking it. Totally worth the money. A plus, would do it again. Probably would just bring my recorder and let them keep the EMF and all that stuff. Take the flashlight so you don't bust your ass walking in the dark. So that's what I have for this week. Um, I don't know. Maybe next week will be another spooky story. Maybe next week will be a video about my cat. I don't know. We'll think of something. If you like the video, feel free to leave a comment. Uh, ring that little bell. Hit that thumbs up. Hit the subscribe button. And uh, I will be back next week.